Thank you, Portia and Nadine and Frank for the very powerful discussion that we just had. And uh, we continue with uh, the forum. And here I'm joined by two very important people who do not need any introduction. And uh, Riason has been introduced, I don't know how many times. But um, for those who are joining us online, and uh, I would like to introduce uh, Professor Simon Jami. Um, Simon Jami, uh, born in Switzerland, and now living and working and practicing in, here in Paris, but uh, crisscrossing between the continent of Africa, Europe, and America, and all over the world. And um, he has curated a number of exhibitions and done a lot of research on a number of uh, scholars that includes uh, the founding president of Senegal, none other than Comrade Sengo, and uh, also did uh, biographies of uh, the likes of James Baldwin, curated a number of exhibitions that includes the magician, well, the uh, Africa remix, uh, the 52nd Venice Biennale in 2007, and um, many other exhibitions that uh, the 12th and the 13th edition of the Dakar Binale, the Bamako Photographic Encounter, which uh, he's one of the founders and the founding um, co-editor of uh, the Revenoir, which is a very important publication. And when people are talking about um, maybe reintroducing some of these uh, publications I think the, the, most of these publications, they've got their lives, they come, they live, and we are there to uh, look at those archives and to try to interrogate them. And Riason Naidu, who is uh, why we are all here, who invited us to this uh, uh, important uh, forum, which I have always questioned the idea of us continuously meeting here more than we meet in the continent, but I'm sure the Dakar Binale has proved to be one of the key important platform that uh, we continuously meet in Dakar, in Bamako, and I'm sure there is need for us to be able to also meet in other parts of the continent to be able to uh, question our own practice and our contributions to the contemporary African art. But um, Without wasting much of our time, I would like to say here we are looking at a discussion between the two, uh, Mr. Njami and uh, Riason Naid. So uh, them looking at reciprocal influences from, African, from Africa and France, Paris in 1987, which is entitled Ethne, Color, Music, Fashion, Literature, Advertising, and cinema. Um, I would want to hand over to Professor Njami. Yes. Someone asking the question. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Raphael. And thank you for agreeing to moderate. Uh, it's been great. In fact, it's a good opportunity for me to thank all the speakers um, for moder moderating the panels. Uh, it's uh, very much appreciated, and you did a uh, sterling job, all of you. So thanks for um, assisting with that. Um, Simone and Jami needs no introduction, but uh, of course Raphael did uh, introduce uh, Simone, for those who are not aware. Uh, we know Simone, not only us, but he's known internationally. And two uh, or three projects perhaps stand out more than others. One is Africa Remix. Okay, well, uh, maybe more than two or three, okay? We'll, we'll talk about that and you can disagree in the conversation. Um, and of course, uh, recently it was also Divide Comedy, um, which uh, toured in Germany and in the US. Um, but I am going back a little bit because uh, uh, many people don't know another side of um, Simon and Jami's uh, history. And uh, Simon uh, was a writer first. 
uh, with four novels, uh, published um, 1962, by the age of 23, is that correct? Yeah. Uh, Coffin and Co., which was translated into English, and um, there were three other titles, um, that uh, three of which you see on your screen. And uh, just shortly after that, um, was it 91? This? Yeah, 1991 uh, was the biography on James Baldwin. Um, and Ou les devoirs de violence, uh, mais c'est pris de, de un autre titre uh, de roman. Yeah, oh. okay. right. And, um, oh, there's one missing here. Yeah, should be single somewhere around, huh? but uh, they're single. Oh, I see why I put that there, because it's chronological. Um, Rive Noir came uh, shortly after um, the James Baldwin and uh, was launched in 1991. This was a huge project uh, that went on for 10 years. Um, we did not discuss Rive Noir uh, during the magazine panels today. We only discussed uh, Black Orpheus and we discussed uh, Nka because I've already had several conversations with uh, Simon and the Rive Noir team, uh, one in Venice, one in Paris already. And of course, Rive Noir is very well known uh, in Paris. Not only in Paris, internationally. Um, you can see this is going to be an easy conversation. <laughs> <laughs> um, and of course, uh, Cité Sengo was in 2006, much later, biography on Sengo, uh, in which Simone did many interviews with Sengo. And, uh, you know, it's, I've read it actually. And, uh, it's quite a warm account of Senghor, and there is one um, uh, distinction uh, Simon makes where he differentiates himself uh, from one of the, the things that, Sim, um, that uh, Senghor says, uh, which is also about this relationship between nature and, um, and the rationale. Emotion. Emotion? Okay. And reason. And reason. Okay. <laughs> okay, I think maybe it's, do we, it's time up? No. <laughs> Not yet. Okay. Not yet. Okay. So um, today what we're going to discuss is uh, maybe another project that's neglected in Simone's repertoire of projects. This is Ethnic Color and uh, it was done in 1987 in Paris. And I wanted to focus on Ethnic Color because uh, there's hardly any information online, although there is a publication. So it did come out with a publication in 1987. And um, uh, I thought we could, uh, you know, shed some light on this project and have Simone talk to us about it. Um, it was done, well, the publication was done with uh, Bruno Tilliet. And, um, oh. You, you've got the same pose now. You okay. took this image? Yeah. It's not no, no, I didn't take it. It was oh. Nicolas de, okay. de Calzo. I thought it was too good for you. <laughs> um, so, um, so here we are talking about ethnic color. And um, this was, uh, ethnic color was shown at the Cirque de Hiver in Paris. Uh, and I think I have an image of, of that because I was cycling beyond, uh, past there one day and I saw Cirque de Iver and I said, oh wow, this, is, uh, this sounds familiar. Mm -hmm. And so this is an original photo taken by yours truly about uh, a year or two ago. Uh, Simon, what inspired this? What is, firstly, what is ethnic color? Well, I mean, what was it, an exhibition? Was it a kind of festival? It was a it was a festival. I, we had a movie festival, some book reading, some concerts, uh, some food, and um, an exhibition. Okay. I hope your other answers are going to be a bit more elaborate. Well, yeah. I, I answer precisely to your questions. I hope your questions are going to be more open. 
All right, so there we have it. So that is ethnic color, and that's what we came to hear. So thank you very much for coming. Um, <laughs> So how, how, did, how did it come about, you know? I think it was the, the worst period in my life. I, I believed in politics and I was confusing art or uh, culture with politics. And when you look at it nowadays, it's so funny. At that time, uh, the National Front made 12% in some suburbs and I thought it was unacceptable. Now we don't know who's going to be the next president of France, so time has passed. Um, and, um, well, I was invited as a side gig in some uh, radio program, because probably they needed a young, uh, bright, black African, whatever. Um, but uh, the star of that program was, uh, was Danielle Mitterrand, who was then the first lady. And she was running a foundation, and um, at some moment, since I was there to give some loud that, I was asked what I thought of the foundation, and I said uh, that Africa didn't need foundations and whatever, and that's the only moment I spoke. But then, at the end of the program, the lady came to me and said, okay, do you have ideas, etc." I say, okay, now she's fooling me, she wants to show that she's a nice lady. So I say, if you have a project, uh, send it. I say, sure. Uh, I went back home and I called my uh, main advisor, my mother, told her the story and she said, well, she asked you, just send her a project. So I had to invent a project. And I took the, um, the pretext of, uh, of this National Front being too high to think of a project and uh, actually the articulation, intellectual articulation of the project was mainly in, in the exhibition where I invited people like uh, Michel Barcelo, Jean-Michel Basquiat, Gérard Fromanger, etc and a bunch of uh, non-Western artists. And the game was that it was a show without labels. And of course the artists I shoot, like uh, Hélène Delpa, etc., etc., were people who were uh, there to, to play with the preconceptions. And the idea was for people to say who was coming from where. And of course they were mistaken half of the time. Because it was the time where what we call African art or whatever was the realm of ethnographers and ethnologists and uh, uh, they wanted to show the otherness. They were not that interested in, uh, in the art but in their field works. And I remember I, I made many friends along my I, my long life. I remember I was invited in 1991 as a young scholar by Susan Vogel who was doing a show called Africa Explores the 20th Century and she asked me to manage the, the artist panel and of course it was nice to be there with all those young uh, professors average 65, all specialists in Africa and was all telling something about the artist. Uh, he's, co he's coming from there, and they eat this, and uh, this tradition is that. So that's probably why you find those colors, da 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 da. And of course, as usual, I didn't know what to ask to those artists during the panel, so I just started to take notes. And then when the panel started, I just asked them what they thought of, what the specialists of speciality have said about them. And of course, they said the contrary. Susan Vogel never invited me again. Um, but yes, the, the show was just for those people with preconceptions. And I mean, I even remember for Remix, uh, some very specialists of Africa came to me and said, Mr. Njami, you're again putting things upside down. You call it, you're calling it Africa Remix and you invited some Algerian, some Moroccan, some Egyptians. Well, I told him I didn't draw the map, so just to tell you. And 
that was much later, so imagine in 87. So I sent that project to, um, uh, to, to, to Danielle Mitterrand. I told her I would like to have some African chef uh, to cook at the Espace Cardin. Well, it was very nice at that time because I didn't have any notion of money. Uh, Danielle gave me an office, a phone, and a phone book. And for, for a moment I thought I was the president because when I had a secretary, whoever would call, will call back. I was like, wow, this is magic. So we called Pierre Cardin and said, no problem. Of course, the African cuisine is not exactly the nouvelle cuisine, so they made a mess in the kitchen is all the thing that we're doing. Um, I had a cinema given where we, we showed uh, African films. We did a concert at uh, La Grande Halle de la Villette with people like Mano Di Bango, Bernard Lavillier, I don't remember who was there. It was something very, very funny because, of course, I had people, bouncers everywhere. And I told them a bunch of people are going to come and say they're my friends. If they don't have an invitation, you don't let them in. At that time, Jack Long was the Minister of Culture. He came and they wouldn't let him in because he didn't have an invitation. So I had to run and to explain to them, you know, he gave money for that as a minister. But you said no invitation, no, no, no. So yes, and uh, we, we, we did some readings, etc., etc. And um, that's why I gave up, because obviously from 12% the National Front moved to 46 or something, and maybe more now. So uh, young men never do something for political reasons. So, um, I mean this, I mean was the festival done by yourself and then the book done in collaboration with uh, Bruno, or how can you... Yes, the, the, the festival was done by myself and, um, and the book, I had a couple of friends. Uh, there was a publication company called Autrement, and I had a friend who was chief editor there. And I came to him, I said, I would like a book, because I, I'm a book person, you know, you do things and then there's no traces. Even if that one, thank you, I don't have it anymore. Um, very kind of you. Uh, so I, 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 I came to, to Bruno and I said, let's do this. I said, fine. So I selected the, the writers, etc. And I, I didn't know anyone to write about architecture. And he told me, well, I know a guy. Yeah. I said, okay, fine. This is the length and I need, and this is the deadline. And after some weeks, I wouldn't see that the missing paper. And finally, Bruno told me, well, he sent me the paper, but I'm not sure it's okay. I said, who's asking you to okay it? So he gave me the paper. Let's say the writer was asked five pages. He wrote 30 pages. And, uh, and the text was not talking about architecture. And I loved it. And um, of course, I had to cut it. And uh, the guy didn't kill me, and we became good friends. His name is Jean-Louis Pivin. And uh, when the adventure of Revenoir started, we, we did that together. Yes, uh, so uh, just to follow up on uh, this relationship with uh, Bruno Tilliet, uh, did you work with him after this project? Well, you know, uh, back then I was, I think, finishing. Uh, have you finished your PhD? Uh, let's not talk about not that. Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> so I was finishing a couple of things, and uh, and I was writing in, uh, in magazines. I was writing in, in uh, Autrement, writing text there. So our relationship then was just uh, linked to that. But since he was the go-between between, between uh, Jean-Louis and I, of course, we invited him to, to join when we started to think of Revenoir. And he was the only one who had uh, professional skills as far as publishing was concerned. We were just uh, amateur. We've never published anything then as publishers. 
And just to um, elaborate on this, because what I've read, it wasn't really an exhibition on African art or African expression as such, but it was also a project of France and Africa relations, cultural it, relations. It was not a project on France and Africa relationship. I told you about the exhibition, you are not listening. I told you about Cello, Fromanger, Basquiat, were invited in the show, a bunch of Hélène uh, Del Prague, etc., a bunch of uh, non-African artists were invited, and, uh, and it was to get rid of the preconceptions. I have to repeat what I just said before. Yeah. So, no, it was, not, um, it was not about Africa, it was on Africa and on perceptions. We're getting there, we're getting there. Uh, be patient with me. I am patient. <laughs> I mean, what, can we elaborate on this environment in the 1980s? Because uh, 1987 in Paris, Ethnicala is produced. Um, I'm mean, assuming there were no exhibitions by black curators in Paris at the time. Well, there was no black curators, <laughs> so I couldn't have had <laughs> exhibitions made. Uh, but, but it was um, an interesting time, that, um, the, the 80s, because uh, every 10 years, I think, France tend to say there's an African wave. It started in the 20s, last century. Uh, so there was an African wave in the, the early 80s, uh, supported by a magazine like Autrement, but also like um, this magazine created by Jean-François Bizot was actuel, and was showing a lot of uh, musicians from uh, outside of Europe, so a lot of writers, etc., etc. And that was the time where uh, a lady was working on, uh, on African writers in Paris, and she only found me when she was almost publishing her book because I was not listed on the African stuff. It was the time where uh, I would see people, <laughs> it was funny, um, in Vienna once, as a kid who was playing drums. He was awful. And his girlfriend had dreadlocks, she was Austrian, she came with the baskets for the music. I said, are you crazy? This guy doesn't know how to. So, your brother I said, might be a brother, but my ears are sensitive. And um, I said, tell the kid to come. And the kid came and said, what is this noise? He said, well, sir, I'm, I'm here to study, I'm studying medicine and uh, I just wear this boo-boo and I do boom, 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 and people like it, but I don't know how to play. <laughs> but, and they don't care because I'm African and I'm supposed to know how to play. So uh, there was a lot of that in, in, those, uh, in those 80s. And as a novel you didn't mention, uh, published in 89, uh, that was called African Gigolo. Because it was a time, I remember I was a kid in a nightclub with my friends, and we're really tired, like four in the morning, and there's this African in Bubu who comes and asks my girl to dance, and she said, I'm exhausted. The guy said, oh, you don't want to dance with me because you're racist. And the girl stood and went to dance. I was like, what, what the hell's going on? I mean, <laughs> so these are the kind of things that they were doing. And uh, of course, music was strong, but um, racism, was uh, because people don't like to, to be kicked out. And the African has always been the dooms. I'm talking about the black Africans. Uh, but the French didn't like the Algerians because they kicked them out. Uh, so it was more focused on them than on Africa because you know, the African, black Africans were almost invisible. They were the student, they were the musician, they were the pimp. But, uh, nothing to, to be worried about. But it was a nice moment to live because the music was good, there was no AIDS, there was no COVID, there was, I could drink and do all sorts of things. Nice moments, yeah. How important um, is 
or was ethnical in your career as a curator because, um, I mean, following this, uh, exhibitions curated by you started to emerge 1993, 1994, if I'm, if I'm correct. Uh, what it did to my career is that I decided I would never do such a crazy thing anymore. I said, well, mounting an exhibition is not for me. And there's always a couple of people to piss me off. I was uh, one day in a museum in Spain, run by a friend, and there was an exhibition there that was called Africa Oi. And I told him, how can you put a show like this? You should have called it uh, whoever's collection, but don't say Africa Oi, which means Africa today, because nothing of what is shown there uh, translate what what is happening in Africa today. And the guy told me, well, do an exhibition. And as stupid as I am, I, I did an exhibition. And that's why I never published a book after that, because this thing is really time consuming. But um, no, it, it did nothing to whatever you call my career. I didn't know I had one. Um, I didn't even think of, of whatever. I, mean, I was a writer, and I'm still a writer, even if I don't write anymore. Uh, so all this uh, contemporary, arty, blah, 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 was not, absolutely not in my mind. Could we say um, that Ethnic Color was a forerunner uh, to Rive Noir? Yes, one could say that now. Um, because when we started Rave Noir, we started to think of Rave Noir, uh, what we wanted to show were all the contemporary expressions, music, literature, uh, photography, etc., etc. And, uh, and this is what was done in, uh, in, in ethnic color. So maybe let's uh, take a look at some of the texts. Um, um, I mean, this is one of the quotes that I pulled out, translated. Uh, these are not my words, so just in case. You yeah, I know, I know they're thing. not your words. Yeah. I, was just <laughs> I was just checking the translation. Um, no, because there, there's, there's also that, that thing that, that would bother me, not still bothering me, and that some arrogant people thinking they're giving, and that other people are just good for receiving. So I just wanted to, to put the balance there and to say, well, we're given, we give, we're receiving, uh, and they receive. And uh, not to place, I, uh, I mean, uh, Derrida made a, <laughs> made a conference in Jerusalem some years ago, and Derrida was really a jazz player. He came there and told to the people, I have no sympathy for victims. Of course, everybody, wah, 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 wah. but I have no sympathy for victims. And uh, there's a moment where when you're a victim, it becomes a, a commodity, it becomes a, a comfort zone. You go to the French institution, you beg for money and they give, etc., because you're the poor guy. Um, I mean, unfortunately, I was never a poor guy, so I couldn't play that game, so I had to play the other one. And um, and, and to, to kill the arrogance of people who would come and tell me that they are going to teach me something. Uh, this guy who came, another professor of professorology, came to me, ah, young man, uh, where were you born? I said, Switzerland. I said, huh. Uh, where do you live, Paris? Huh. And your parents? I told him, Cameroon. Oh, yeah, I've been in Cameroon. I studied there. I started to tell me things about Cameroon, and of course I shot him up and said, I'm sorry, you, you know nothing. Because I, I was in Ethiopia once with some uh, German scholar, and she wrote a book about Ethiopian civilization, and she was teaching there, and having this conversation. And she was speaking German and a kind of an English, so she needed a translator because she had to speak with Amharic people, and her translator was speaking a kind of an English, an Amharic. So I was imagining her going to do her field work, asking, what is this pot for? 
and the translator understanding whatever and asking to the guy who would say whatever he wants, etc. And then she would be the the, 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 the the star of the Ethiopian studies. So this is the only thing that, that really bothered me and this is why I did ethnic color and this is uh, why I'm doing what I'm doing. I, I hate to be bothered. Well, we can see that. Um, but uh, just I also picked out this uh, quotation, also from the introductory text. Yes, one of my, my favorite philosopher when I was a king, a king. I'm, I'm just a prince, I'm not a king. Uh, was Ernst Bloch. And Ernst Bloch uh, once wrote that uh, the essential question uh, the insolvable question is the question of the we. And, uh, and I think this, this has always been in me. The, the we is what I'm interested in, what makes us human being. Uh, there's no African photography, there are Africans who are producing photography. There's no African art, there are Africans who are producing art, like any other continent would be producing things. So. The culture of human is, uh, is what I'm interested in. And that's why I, I shot all the people I, who disagree with me, which is very human, you would say. So, um, Ethnicolor, you collaborated with Bruno, right? For the publication. For the publication only. And um, then, of course, uh, much later, there is... Um, Africa Remix at the Pompidou, yes. which started in Germany. Yes, in Düsseldorf. So, there aren't so many projects in Paris in well, between. I decided, but I don't know when I decided that, that I would do a, a project in Paris every seven years. Okay. Like those relationships, seven year like limit, time limit. Yeah. But um, I, I think what I'm getting at is, um, is it necessary to collaborate with French curators in institutions in order to realize projects in Paris? Or is it more difficult as an independent curator? No, it's not. And you don't have to, to work with French curators. You have to work with French institutions. Uh, I don't know who was directing uh, the, the Pompidou then. I think it was Alfred Pacman. Uh, in Dusseldorf, it was Jean Hubert Martin. And these were people I knew. So um, I, I don't think it's that complicated. I, I just think that France is complicated uh, because I guess France thinks that they know more than anyone else because Africa. They don't even realize that they're only doing a bit of things about uh, the French-speaking Africa. So they, they think they're the specialists of the thing. And this is why you find very few uh, curators in, in the French institutions. It's not in France that uh, Elvira Duangani would be the director of a museum like Magba. It's not in France that uh, Bonaventure would be directing a place like the Haus der Kultur and der Welt, and so on and so forth. Uh, these are the limits of this republic. But I mean, there, there's something uh, interesting that have always been uh, interesting to me is that uh, Africa has always been discussed. It's less true today, but out of Africa. Uh, people were busy making exhibitions out of Africa and nothing was happening, quote-unquote, in Africa. But when, uh, on the idea of Songor, Senegal decided to make its Biennale, it made a shift. I think there's a need, and this was said earlier, there's a need to, to talk about Africa in Africa every now and then. Because I know some, some African who haven't been in Africa for a while, but who are talking about Africa all around the world. 
I think that every now and then you need to reconnect to, to your reality. If not, you become the ethnographer of your own ethnography, uh, pretending you are something that you not necessarily are pretending you're talking for people whom you don't know. Um, so to, to, to make exhibition in Paris every seven years is enough because I'm busy making exhibition elsewhere. Uh, this reminds me of, um, you know, something Jean-Luc Pavin wrote in uh, Rive Noir in the Paris um, feature, 1996. And uh, he says um, that many African artists come to Paris uh, looking to further their careers, but um, eventually they all find opportunities in Lisbon or in London or in Germany or in New York and um, that uh, there are less opportunities, well this is 1996 I'm talking about, uh, for um, African artists in Paris. I don't know if there's less opportunities and I, I don't really care. The, the world is big enough. Tayou is living in Brussels. Uh, my young friend is living in Brussels. Well, no, Tayou is living in Ghent. Um, Sami Badoji is living in Brussels, etc., etc. I mean, when you don't find something in a place, you you go to another place, and um, and I don't think that. I mean, Paris used to be wonderful when we think of it, the parties in the twenties, uh, all the artists coming, discussing, having drinks together, etc. Even if the French government. Uh, suspected uh, Picasso to be an anarchist and gave him a hard time. But still, there was a place where ideas were, were taking place. I'm not sure it's happening anymore. You just need to look at the budget of the culture. Uh, somebody in the room knows more than me what are the numbers. But uh, if you look at the budget of culture in the 80s and the budget of culture nowadays in France, it's appalling. I mean, there's much more to say about uh, this this matter um, because, I mean, from my observations of even recently, uh, many many exhibitions on African art, contemporary, are uh, always uh, curated by French curators. I, and I don't know that. I, mean, I, 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 I know that Koyoko is curating shows, Bonaventure is curating shows, Salah Hassan, who is not yet French, is curating shows, etc., etc. Uh, which African show have you seen, curated so, by a French? Um, I'm talking about in Paris. Yeah, which one? Uh, well, I was looking at the ones at uh, Louis Vuitton recently on South Africa, uh, 2017. Um, there are other examples, but uh, there doesn't seem to be... Yes, but Louis Vuitton is a private space. They do whatever they want with their money. Uh, from my observation, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, there seems to be less collaboration with uh, African curators on shows on African art. Well, first of all, if you do that, you'll be forced to revise your, your position because you'll have an antagonist to, to discuss with. And, um, and secondly, if you look at uh, the museum system, uh, if you're a young French artist, you have not a lot of spaces where to exhibit in France. So if you're a young African artist, why should you have more space? And um, I don't think I know cura African curators living in Paris. Might be wrong, but I think I, I don't know them. And, and this is not the point. I think Paris is not the point. Africa is the point. Uh, I'm happy Malik is there because uh, I think that the Dakar Biennale have done much more uh, for African artists than any other place in the world. I think the Bamako Biennale, before people decided to make a coup every six months, have done more on African photography or photography produced by African but than any other place in the world. But we're living in the illusion that, uh, and that France is going to 
make some money or that uh, Switzerland for the sake of it is going to make some money. I think we have to to shift the, the paradigm. And, I mean, you, you don't find a job in Paris, so why would you insist Paris doesn't want to exhibit your work? The, the, the world is much bigger than that. I think Paris is not a problem. Um, I was in some conferences somewhere and there were some African journalists who were complaining, I think it was in Switzerland, said, well, look at your newspapers, look at the place you give us, you just give us a quarter of a page, and normally just to talk about catastrophes. And of course, the, the, the Swiss guy was too polite, and I asked to this African journalist, how many pages do you give to Switzerland in your country? All right, back to uh, ethnic color. Um, <laughs> so I'm just, I scanned some pages from the uh, publication and um, I thought it would jog your memory a bit to... Oh, if you go back to yeah. the four pages, uh, you didn't translate that title, it's very important. Yeah, the missing meetings. Yes, something like that. Yeah. And it's, it's just talking about the relationship uh, between France and its former colonies. And the relationship could have been much better, but, uh, but it's not, obviously. And they even forced Césaire to be in the Panthéon without his own will. And not the body, they just put a, a thing. Um, no, I think that there's something rotten in the kingdom of, of France. And I guess uh, the first round of the election showed it. If, if France was the country that it used to be, uh, Marine Le Pen would not be in the second round and, and my socialist party would not be at less than 2%. Oh. Uh, you should come to Saint Denis. Maybe you should think about moving to Saint Denis. Uh, uh, we have a socialist uh, party there uh, and it was communist. I, 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 don't go to, I don't go to suburbs. <laughs> Yes, I, I, I read this quotation where you prefer champagne to palm wine, uh, which, uh, which would fit in perfectly with Paris. No, I don't Denis. know where you, where you read that. I like champagne. It's and, in an interview with Sabine Sessou. Well, Sabine tend to okay, she invent exaggerated. things. Okay. Anyway, maybe we should talk about uh, the publication and the importance of words. No, and there's something also when I was listening uh, the conversations before, is that there's a, a, a terrible gap that doesn't help critically, is that um, I know all the magazines that were introduced here today, Malik know them, uh, but uh, the English-speaking part of Africa don't know much about what is produced in the French-speaking part. And this is a pity, uh, because all those resources should be put together. Because at that time, somebody invented the, the cold water. He doesn't realize that it was invented in another country some years before. And uh, it's just a waste of time and, and energy. So words, yes, words are are crucial. Uh, there's nothing I can do. Well, I, I mean, can't let's plant just... a tree, I can't plant. So I think that words, <coughs> since uh, Gutenberg made his revolution, uh, words are crucial because words, written words, remain. I'm not going to bother with, you, with some Latin. And, um, and what matters is to produce words, is to produce some other critical gazes instead of complaining of not being uh, recognized here or there, but to, 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 to publish your own um, vocabulary, to publish your own analysis. Uh, there was a time when I was a kid, um, some guy who was a professor in, at the Sorbonne would send me some of his master's students because they wanted to do some African art studies and he knew nothing about African art. I told him, Philip, you, you should pay me half of your salary. And same with books. I was talking about this uh, 
German historian specialized in Ethiopia, when the only book you have as a reference is a book written the way I described it, well, then you would think you know things, and you might even consider, because what is written is sacred, like in the Bible, you might believe, because it's written, that it's true. I mean, this is something I've noticed in your work. All your projects have a publication, I think, from the very earliest. Um, and, of course, starting with ethnic color. I mean, it's not a catalog by any means. No. It's black and white uh, photographs sometimes. Uh, but at least it's a record. So, um, so obviously, the, the written word is uh, something that's very important uh, for you, someone like you, also coming from a background of literature and uh, with a PhD in... What do we have to... No, I have... I mean, yeah. Yeah. Okay, no, sorry, that was... Maybe it's not... Sorry, I take that back. And, <laughs> it's too late. <laughs> but um, I don't want to... I thought I'll just uh, you know, go through some of the themes because I think we, we don't have too much time, but if there's something you want to uh, maybe, um, you know, uh, elaborate on. Um, this, these are some of the articles in the uh, publication. And uh, oh, this is, well, maybe we can talk about that because this is, uh, you know, advertising was one of the uh, genres that was a part of the festival. Um, not advertising, but those posters. Those kind of. uh, because it, it tells you how. Uh, the African, the black people, or the form of people look at the, the, the Native American, look at the, the Chinese, I suppose, the Chinese. Uh, so when people <laughs> make those kind of drawings to talk about other people, it tells you about what they think about those people. So I wanted those, those imageries to be there just to to know where we are coming from. And when um, Sangor wrote in a poem, I shall tear apart all the banana laughters from the walls of France, because banana, the chocolate, was represented by a perfect Negro. Is a ba -ba 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 -ba. Yes, this is where we are coming from. And I hope this is not where we're going back to. But uh, a world of preconception. But, I mean, preconception works much better when you're talking to ignorant. I remember James Baldwin telling me, you know, young man, if somebody would have told me when I was a kid that uh, Dumas was black, he was talking about being mixed blood, right? that Juma was black, that Pushkin was black. It wouldn't have put more rice on my table, but it would have saved my, my childhood. So the problem is that uh, there's a lot of things we, we don't know, or we think we know. And this is what is important. You cannot have a, a conversation if you have nothing to say. In order to have a decent conversation, you need to speak a couple of languages. I'm not talking about linguistic languages, but you have to, to know the other, who most of the time doesn't know you, but you have to know yourself in order to know how to dance. Because in order to dance, you need to be two. If you don't know the dance, then you... You're finished. So uh, that's why words, written material, memory. We're talking, the, the earlier it was, uh, should we revive, revamp this and that? No, things that are done are done, they're finished. But they should continue in the form of republication, in the form of a digital form, etc., etc., so that people who don't know will know. But uh, to to reset something that was made under certain condition, that was said by Malangatana specialist Mario, uh, make no sense. And uh, whatever was done was contemporary to, to its time. And we can only do things that are contemporary to our times and not, I mean, the, the worst idea in Senegal uh, was um, the, the revival of the, the 66 festival 
but of course there was a megalomaniac president, etc. Uh, the idea of 66 is one thing, but to try to reproduce 66 is another thing. Um, yes, you, you, you need to know your past and uh, in order to create your future. And I think that that, that knowledge uh, come from not only from books that we we were taught. Uh, Edouard Glissant wrote a, a book that was called uh, the, the Antilles Problem, uh, Our Ancestors, the Goals. So those people had to learn our ancestors, the goals. They were supposed to be Asterix and Obelisk at the same time. Uh, so it's, it, it's important to, to know when somebody is not telling the truth. Uh, my dear Isaac de Bancolet, Felicite Wasi. Isaac became a, a kind of a, a star. Then he moved to, to New York. But again, uh, I have a friend who was probably the, the best uh, contemporary playwright. I was writing his plays and one day I introduced him to, to Isaac. I said, okay, I'm going to write real roles. Uh, for for African and Isaac uh, was casted in most of uh, Bernard Michael Tess plays. Um, but yes, uh, a kid I was talking to, he, he made a piece called The Merchant of Venice. And then I told him, you know Shakespeare? He said, yes. You see the preconception, this young Angolese of of course, I ask him, do you know Shakespeare? As if I had to ask him, why shouldn't he know Shakespeare? And I ask, we all have all our preconception. And I say, well, what is it that you like about Shakespeare? He say, he's the only playwright, it was a revolutionary, he's the only playwright who, who wrote a role for a black person. I say, oh, that's a point I never considered when I was looking at Shakespeare, but it's true that uh, Shakespeare wrote Othello, and Othello was played by white performers for a while. And um, anyway, Isaac, yeah. that so was... Amadou Gay took most of the photos. <laughs> uh, yeah, because he was, a, he was a Parisian, a true Parisian. And... Uh, this is the moment when um, Touche pas mon pote, this anti-racist uh, association was created in uh, 87, I guess. So it's a demonstration of uh, we're all together. So the uh, Ethnic Island Festival also featured a number of um, music groups um, and uh, there's a feature on Ray Lema and uh, Manu Dibango. Yeah, because even the, this idea uh, was taken on when, when we did Revue Noir, uh, I wanted to talk about music. I say, well, there's nothing sadder than to talk about music without people being able to listen to music. So we produced CDs so that people could, could listen to uh, to the music we were we were talking about. Um, that's the easy way, somebody said. It goes here, directly there. Uh, unless you're deaf, music always plays something in you. Uh, unless it's this first opera I attended in China and I thought people were mocking me until I discovered that it's my ear that was not properly tuned. And that, that's the thing about preconceptions. I have so many preconceptions, and I know them, and I carry them, and at times I cherish them. Uh, but I fight them when <laughs> they turn against me, or towards me. So I think we're running out of time. Um, Mr. Chikikwa. Uh, well, uh, thank you very much, Eliaswa. Uh, Maybe I would like to open any questions before I also press it. The two. Uh, yes, Malik. Malik Elaji. This is something that carries through to Rivenor. Thank you. Thank you, Simon, for 
<coughs> sharing your experience and I totally agree that the point is not Paris, it's not France, the point is Africa. So I would like to have your opinion about one thing because you have a very great experience in creating and you collaborate and so you deal and you were in dialogue with recently with very young curator living on the continent or from the continent. So I would like to know from your experience and from your perspective, what is, what do you think about the main challenge, the main issue in the future regarding curating? Regarding curating, because the point, in, the point is Africa, regarding curating in the continent and regarding curating also from those young that are living here in Europe and that come from the continent because you talk about Bonaventure, you talk about, so that is the point. Thank you. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, Koyo was a, a young woman when I met her. Bonaventure was in shorts and uh, Elvira thought she wanted to be an architect. Um, the, the, the greatest challenge are education. But having said that, I haven't said anything because education is a challenge everywhere. And let's say that there are places where it's worse than other places, the system itself. Um, there's a moment uh, when we did the issue on, on Cameroon and I sent Hélène Delprat to work with uh, the artists there and Hélène was working with found object, with journals, etc., etc. And people say, you think we're not good enough? You come here, instead of using a canvas, you're doing this. So there are so many ideas. And uh, that there was a, a dictator there who was the, the big boss who studied in, in the 60s in France and never probably opened another book and was teaching there about contemporary art. And um, the, the main problem is, is the education. And as we speak, I'm going in Cameroon in June to, to, to do a curatorial workshop and a critical thinking workshop. I think this is where it starts. Uh, in a lot of places in, in the world, some young curator would come to me and say, I'm a curator. And my first question would say, what have you curated? Mm. Say, well, I have a project. I say, well, when you've curated, you can call yourself a curator. Uh, because to curate doesn't necessarily mean to be in a big museum with a huge budget. It's, it means to have a concept and to apply it in a, in a space. And these are all those things um, uh, those kids need to learn because, as you know, in Dakar, for instance, contrary to Cameroon, you have an art school that I've visited and I won't be uh, making any comment. You, you, you know that, that's cool. And um, there's also this illusion that, uh, that you're going to learn something at school. I mean, well, it's true even here. You have kids in Beaux-Arts who think that when they have their graduation, they are artists, mm -hmm. which is the, the, the best stupidity I've ever heard. So uh, it, it's just to, for people to think for themselves and to find solutions. Uh, I advise somebody, I don't know where it was, uh, uh, you seem to be well off. You, your parents have a house, yes. They have a cellar, yes. Curate your first show there. Uh, start. It's only by curating that you you know what what curating is. But you, you need to think, and I think that we we need to find some um, parallel system of education. As you know, I did 12 years of master classes in photography uh, for the the young uh, African photographers. Sami Balochi was one of the first students. Chris was part of that adventure. Uh, and I'm doing this critical uh, thinking thing with Moleskine mm. on the continent, etc., etc. And I was in Makerere University once and we were having this discussion and the dean came to me and told me, 
ah, Simon, you're doing such a great job with the kids. Could you do the same with my teachers? I told him, no, <laughs> they're finished, they're too old, they're, they're finished. So um, there's something we have to bear in mind and we, we don't have to use it always as a slogan. Uh, Africa is supposed to be a young continent. So we have to give the tool to that youth to, to be able to, uh, to change their own destiny. But we have to be there as much as we can and not just to talk about it. And I'm not thinking of anyone um, never being personal. <laughs> um, yes, for me it's education, but another type of education is awareness, is critical thinking, is not just to know how to read or to have read uh, Hegel in German, uh, but it's about, I mean this is this thing Deleuze was using, the famous metaphor of the toolbox. We have to give, to give toolboxes to those kids so that they can invent their own uh, box and their own tools. Because if not, uh, the books will still be written by the same people, the same books will be uh, used in uh, university. At least Cameroon and are very creative. Uh, Cameroon qualified itself beating Algerians in a very improbable game. And uh, I was sent uh, <laughs> a, a, a copy of the theme, the philosophical theme, for the next uh, baccalaureat in Cameroon. It was a quote from Rigo Bersong, who is the coach, the football coach. <laughs> okay, why not? Um, but uh, we, we have to find different ways, and in order to find different ways, um, when we're talking about an exhibition, for instance, when we're talking about a Biennale, um, to make a Biennale doesn't mean anything if you don't know where you're making the Biennale and for whom you're making the Biennale and how are you going to to maneuver uh, in order for your Biennale not to be empty after a week where everybody comes from outside and the Biennale is perceived as something stranger and foreign. These are the kind of things uh, we need to know, to, to bring people in, uh, in museums. Uh, contemporary art is not an easy thing. I mean, if you're looking for um, money to do a Van Gogh show, you'll find it. If you're looking for money to find a, to make a contemporary art show, not talk about Africa, whatever, it will be more complicated because less, less person uh, will believe that uh, you, you, you throw something there, blah, 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 that is art. Uh, so it's an education in uh, Africa has the, the chance to be, to be young still. So that's where the battle is to be fought. Uh, the old people, they're just there to die. Okay. Um, any one more last question? I think you can conclude. Okay, I'm sure if you've got any other questions, we can continue at the cocktail. But I would like to thank um, Professor Simon Jami. Thank you, Director. Uh -huh. And um, also thank Riason Naidu for organizing this. And I'm sure we all have been learning a lot out of uh, these deliberations. Thank you, Doctor. Yes. So I have a few things to say uh, just before we go. Uh, yes, it's true there will be a cocktail um, following. I think we can just meet in the reception and uh, Elsa will take us somewhere, or maybe it's there. Okay. But I just want to say thank you very much to Inasha for uh, making this conference possible and for supporting it and for entrusting me um, with the content uh, of the conference. Uh, so thank you very much. And uh, maybe we can. Can we give him a pam pam? And um, also to the speakers that traveled uh, very far to be here and with lots of challenges, visa and COVID. And, and missing the flights. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
but really it was not, it's not easy to travel in these times and uh, especially uh, with, uh, you know, visa offices in different cities, etc. Mario, Crete, um, I'm thinking of you. Um, but also I would like to thank uh, Franz Nierlich, the um, director of research at Inasha, who many of you have met already, and Marin, and someone I worked very closely with was Elsa, Mm. Najm, uh, did I say it right? Correct. Um, who uh, really went out of her way to organize change of rooms and change flights and, uh, you know, beyond uh, the normal call of duty, because I've seen what the normal call of duty is in France, and normally after six o'clock or seven o'clock, or if it's a public holiday or if it's a weekend, people don't work. And uh, Elsa. Uh, worked 24 hours mm. uh, <laughs> and uh, always with a smile so it was a real pleasure uh, to work with you Elsa and uh, last but not least uh, sometimes we tend to forget but uh, this has been a simultaneous translation mm. And uh, we haven't seen the uh, translators. Maybe you can come and see us. <laughs> can, can you come to the stage? Uh, or do I need to speak in French? We would like to see you. Um, but um, if I can mention uh, Valentina Gardet and Grasse uh, Coston, thank you very much. Uh, some of the tea breaks that we took were before the translators to take a body break and to have a tea. Um, so those were the reasons for the pause. And, um, you know, we are forgetting the technical team in the box mm. uh, that organized all the projections and the PowerPoint and the Zoom. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, And Simone says I must forget, I must uh, thank my mother also, my parents in general. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you all for attending also because otherwise we'd be speaking to ourselves. Uh, and uh, let's continue the con conversation uh, over the cocktail. Thank you.